in here the question. But SubhanAllah, the same ground rules of yesterday applies. Be respectful, be attentive, whether you agree or disagree with the personality of the figure, listen and learn. And we'll be starting shortly. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, we're going to talk about feminism, but before we get to the history and the dark agenda of feminism, we have to recognize that this is an issue that affects everyone in the world, and Muslims are no exception. Uh, there are so many horror stories connected to feminism and the way that feminism has restructured society. And some of these stories, if I share with you, you won't even believe me. You'll think that I'm just making the, these things up. But I guarantee you that these are true stories, things that I have seen with my own eyes. So one of the big examples was recently a brother was married, his wife went overseas to visit family and she took her, took the children, they had two children and she was very religious, wearing hijab, going to the masjid, studying Islam, studying deen. She goes overseas to a Muslim country to visit her family. Then she comes back after a month. And to the shock and horror of her husband, she came back with another man. And so he's shocked. He says, 
Okay, who is this? She said, don't worry about it. This is a friend of mine. Uh, he wants to live in the U.S. He's going to stay at our house. So I, but this is a strange man. What do, you, what do you mean? This is not appropriate. You know, here's, if you don't care about me, at least care about our children. So I, no, you know, this is fine. Why do you have a bad assumption about me? Have Hosno Von. By the way, you need to sleep in the, on the couch tonight. So what, does, what is he supposed to do in this situation? Can he say, uh, no, I'm the man of the house. This guy needs to leave. Can he, he, can he say that? No, he cannot. Why? She says, don't touch me. Don't raise your voice. This is domestic violence. I'm going to call the police. So this, this brother is in shock, doesn't understand what's going on. All of a sudden, this strange man is coming, and he, he's not saying much, but he's there, he's sitting on the couch, getting ready for bed in his house. So then he calls another friend, a mu another Muslim friend. He says, well, what do I do in this situation? You need to leave. You need to get out of the house. She can call the police at any time and accuse you of hitting her. And guess what? They're going to arrest you. That's the law. That's the actual law in the United States. So he had to leave his own house. He, he was basically forced out of his own house. This is the feminist influenced legal system, police system. And then eventually, obviously, they were divorced. He lost his house. It goes without saying he lost his wife. He lost his custody to his children. You might think that this is a strange story. This is something that ex is exceptional. And I admit, yeah, it's, it's extreme. But this is not as uncommon as you think. Another brother recently married so difficult to find a, a wife a wife who actually is religious but religious doesn't mean just wearing the hijab and praying five times a day religious means are you going to abide by islam islam's definition of rights and duties within a marriage and be an actual traditional muslim wife or does religious mean that, yeah, you, you wear the hijab, like barely, like maybe a kind of turban hijab, you got to look fashionable for your Instagram, and you follow the celebrity sheikhs, and oh, mashallah, I love the lecture by Sheikh Fulan. And is that what religious means? And you have like all of these guys following you on your Instagram, and then when your new husband, you've been married only for a week, tells you, actually, honey, I'm not comfortable with all of these guys in your DMs. And she says, excuse me, you don't trust me? Why are you trying to control me? This is my life. You shouldn't have bad assumptions. Don't you know what Sheikh Fulan on YouTube says about Husna Van? and not having this controlling behavior? Didn't you know that Khadija عنها, was a businesswoman? And the Prophet وسلم, obeyed her as an employee? Didn't you know that? Go listen to this Sira series by Sheikh Dr. Fulan. You'll get all the deets, the facts about what women's rights are in Islam. These are real stories, like some of you are shaking, you know, nodding your heads, yeah, I've heard of this. And she'll literally go to her family and say, he's, he's trying to force me to not have, you know, these online followers. He's telling me to change my, the way I dress. He's telling me not to go out at certain times. I want to go out with my friends. He's trying to control me. This is abuse. And the marriage dissolves. Or the other brother that I heard about earlier this year. And he said, look, I'm telling my wife that I'm not comfortable with some of the interactions she has with, with uh, the opposite sex. 
What does she do? She packs her bag and she flies back to her family. Did she get permission to do that? No. And if you tell her, uh, you need to get permission from your husband before leaving the house. Didn't you know that this is one of the uh, rights that the husband, the wali, has over you? Didn't you learn that? You're listening to all these lectures. You're following all of these celebrity imams. They didn't teach you this? It's like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? This is not Islam. This is patriarchy, and patriarchy is kufr. <laughs> patriarchy is shirk. This is the worship of men. These are the poisonous ideas that have been implanted into the minds of not only our sisters. This lecture is not about a putting our sisters on trial, putting Muslim women on trial. That's not what this talk is about. This talk is about that brother, he calls his friend for backup. He calls his friend who is going to one of these madrasas in the U.S., these liberal influenced madrasas or seminaries or Islamic schools to become an imam and he's looking for backup, back me up on what Islam says about the rights of the husband. And that simp says she has the right to leave you whenever she wants. And if she asks for me to give her a khula, regardless of what you say, I'm going to grant it to her. This is a complete disillusion complete liquidation of the Sharia and Islamic law and Islamic ethics. That is what is happening to our families. Does it make you angry? Because it makes me angry. How can we have families? How can we have marriages as Muslims? The statistics are horrifying. The levels of divorce are horrifying. The levels of Men and women who cannot get married in the first place. It's a disaster. This is an epidemic. We need to wake up. And this is not to put sisters on trial. Because sisters and women by their nature, they follow the lead of men. And I hate to say it, but we have a lot of simps. What is a simp? A simp means... A man who compromises Islam and Islamic ethics for the sake of what he thinks will please women. Doesn't have the backbone to stand up for principle. Doesn't have the backbone to stand up for what Islam says, what the Quran says, what the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says. Doesn't have the backbone to stand for that. Instead, he thinks, oh, I need to... Be so compassionate and merciful for our sisters. This is not compassion. True compassion and kindness and husn al khuluq, proper behavior in every domain of life is defined by Allah and His Messenger. That is true compassion. That is true mercy. That is true, true kindness. Where's the implementation of that? The problem is that people don't understand. We've just followed the disbelievers down the lizard hole, step by step, adopted their ideologies, their assumptions, their delusions, their misunderstanding of human nature. Human nature is clear. And that's why we see so many parallels between Islam and other religions. Islam perfected the rules and regulations for humanity, the rules and regulations for marriage and what is the rights and responsibilities of the husband, what are the rights and responsibility of the wife or wives, what are the rights and responsibilities of children. Islam has perfectly defined that. But we see within other religions, because many of these other religions were based on previous revelation, but they changed and they distorted and they corrupted. But we see some parallels. The idea of men as leaders, the man as the patriarch and the authority, whether it's in his marriage, whether it's in his family, whether it's in society, whether it's on the state level, the community level, everyone is agreed. 
that men have that responsibility and that role as authorities. This is ijma of the human race. This is consensus of the human race. No one has disagreed on this. And when you go to the dictionary and you look up the definition of matriarchy, matriarchy meaning that women have authority in society as opposed to men having authority in society or within the family. The definition in the encyclopedia says, yeah, matriarchy is the authority of women. It's purely hypothetical because no such system has ever existed. No society has been matriarchal in history. Why is that? Because that's human nature. Societies that are separate, separated geographically, separated within history, doesn't matter if you're talking about 50 years ago or 5,000 years ago, they all had the same system of men in authority. This is based on human nature. This is the way that Allah has created human beings. The man takes the lead and the woman follows. This is written into our DNA. And this is the, if you go against this, you go against human nature, it's going to be disaster. Everything is going to unwind. Instead of the perfect harmony that Allah has legislated through the Sharia, all we see is destruction and pain and suffering, the disillusion of family, the disillusion of love. Let's talk about love. It is within the nature of women to be attracted to those who are higher in status. This is a very important concept that we have to understand. Why? Because it goes, this nature of women is contrary to equality. And, you know, I ask the sisters, we can ask them right now. Do you prefer to marry a man who is equal to you in his size, equal or maybe even weaker than you in size? Do you prefer to marry a man who is less intelligent than you, less accomplished than you, less motivated and driven than you? Is that what you prefer? Or do you prefer a man who is stronger, taller, larger, smarter, more successful, has more money. Which, what do you prefer, sisters? You tell me. Because if you want to solve, if you want to destroy the patriarchy, I'll give you the solution to destroying the patri patriarchy right now. It's a very simple solution. When you want to get married, marry a man who is weaker than you, smaller than you, stupider than you, poorer than you, then you can boss him around. You can be the boss. Go ahead. The solution to patriarchy is in your hands, sisters. But for some reason, none of them want to do it. <laughs> none of them want to marry such a man. And that's because that's not in your nature. That's not in your nature. So why pretend that that's not your nature? Why are we pretending that, oh, we need equality. Marriage is about a partnership. Being married, husband and wife, you're equal partners. That's what's more right and moral and beautiful. That's, what, that's the only way you can have real love is if you're partners in a marriage. Who says? The exact opposite. The exact opposite. And it, the, the sad part is that you have these men who are encouraging their wives to go work and succeed in the, in the workplace, to go to the rat race and go get higher and higher education. They're actually married and they're encouraging their wives to do this. Why? Because, you know, I'm not insecure as a man. I'm not insecure. I want my wife to, you know, reach for the stars. What happens? She, and this is so many ex real examples from my generation and even now the younger generation is falling for the same thing now that they're getting to that marriage age. They're encouraging their wives, they're empowering their wives. What happens, especially in this age of affirmative action? His wife starts getting promoted. Her salary starts going up. She matches him in terms of her accomplishments 
her position, her title, her salary, and then she actually exceeds him. Goes past him, makes more money, has a higher position. Then what is going to happen? This is, this is what ha ha will happen. This has happened in, even in my own family. She is not going to, it's not like she's consciously thinking, oh, my husband is a bum. My husband is a loser. She's not consciously thinking about that. She might be very good Muslima, religious Muslima. She's not even going to think that thought. But it's not about what she's thinking. It's about what she feels. It's about her attraction. And that's not something that she can control. That's not something that she can control. I can ask the brothers here. How would you feel you marry your wife and within a year she gains 20 kilos? What's going to happen to your attraction? Are you going to, you might not say, hey, honey, you know, you're gaining a little weight here. Let's cool it. Maybe you won't say that. But that doesn't matter. Like, in terms of your biological reaction, your psychological reaction. Well, the same thing is the case with women and their attraction to men. So she has, how does she express her dissatisfaction? She says, honey, can you please, you know, work a little bit harder? Honey, you know, why aren't we able to afford a better house, a better car? Honey, you know, why? Because what she's doing is she's comparing him to the successful men at her workplace, at her job. And she, whether she's conscious of it or not, is comparing him to the men at work, to the men that she's seeing. And the men that she's seeing at work are more successful than her husband. That affects her attraction to him, to her own husband, even if she is not consciously thinking in those terms. The marriage, they get distant, there's not the same love because there's a physical component to love. There's not the same attraction. There's not the same closeness. They grow distant. They don't talk. They don't share. They don't have the same kind of love that they had earlier in their marriage. And then many of them end up getting divorced. And what, the, what she'll say when she's in her group of girlfriends is, oh, yeah, he was just not taking care of me emotionally. We, got, we grew distant emotionally. He wasn't really you know, the best in terms of communication, some reason. And that's what she may really think. That's what she may really think. But the actual reason for this dissolved, liquidated marriage was her own empowerment. Her own empowerment caused this problem. So who's to blame? It's the husband. It's the husband. If we don't recognize these realities, the biological reality, the things that our fathers knew, our grandfathers knew, our great-grandfathers knew, this was common sense. This generation, for some reason, has forgotten. And it's very clear why. It's not being taught. It's not being talked about. It's not being shared. That's why you have people turning to someone like Andrew Tate. And, okay, he's our Muslim brother, but he's not a role model. Or some of these red pill people online, non-Muslims. We see so many people attracted to these red pill type of personalities who are advocating many haram things. And they shouldn't be taken as role models. But why are our youth turning to such figures? because they didn't get some key lessons from us as teachers. That's the problem. So we have to be talking about these realities and we cannot let the simps and the feminists shut down this conversation. And it's a matter of the future of the ummah. How can we have a future as an ummah if we don't have stable marriages and stable families? The only way that we can achieve that stability and true love and compassion in our homes is by implementing the sharia, by implementing kitab Allah, the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the only way 
to restore love and peace and sakina and rahmah and compassion within our homes. The history of feminism and the agenda of feminism is, is very clear. It is a satanic agenda. It is a satanic system. And it was designed as an attack on religion. It is rebellion against God. It is rebellion against Allah. That is what feminism is about. And from the very beginning, the first wave of feminists, immediately they recognize that they have to attack religion. They have to attack, the, in the West, they attack the church. They attack the Bible. They said that these, this patriarchy is holding women back. It is oppressing women, it is turning women into slaves. We have to overturn the, the religion. They targeted Christianity, they targeted Judaism, and they targeted Islam. They targeted every culture and every religion in the world. Because every religion has the same basic model that men are in charge, men are leaders. And they slowly attacked the concept of, well, why aren't there women who are leaders of society? We need to give women the vote. We need to make sure that women are in the workplace. We need to make sure that women are in politics. That was the first wave to create equality between men and women. The second wave, they took it to the family. They said, well, why should we assume that women are mothers? Why should we assume that women are caregivers? Why should we assume that mothers are nurturing or women are nurturing? These are gender roles and they are holding women back. This is a source of oppression. So we need to abolish gender roles. We need to abolish the concept of motherhood. That was the second wave. Then the third wave, well, we need to challenge the concept of being a woman. Even the idea that you are a woman, this is an old, outdated idea, a relic of patriarchy. Even the concept of being a woman is something that will hold you back from true freedom, true happiness. So we have to challenge even the concept of what is a woman? And now we're in the situation today where even if you ask people to define what a woman is, they are confused. They can't do it. So this is the progression of feminist history. It's only a history of about 150 to 200 years. But it has always been satanic and destructive, uh, subversive to society, to all society, not just Muslims and Islam. What distinguishes Islam is that we are the last holdout against this satanic force. Last night I talked about Islam being the last man standing against the satanic force of liberalism. Feminism is, is a sub-ideology of liberalism. Similarly, we are the last man standing. But unfortunately, we have elements within our community that are opening the door and ushering in this feminist influence and adopting certain ideas that have nothing to do with Islam. And that is being weaponized to destroy marriages, to destroy families, to destroy our community. So we have to say no. We have to say enough is enough. Our sisters need to start getting mean with the feminists. The sisters have a responsibility. There's a sister, for example, that's demanding, oh, well, why in the masjid do we have to be in the back? We need to be at least side by side with the men without any barrier. Why are you trying to hide the sisters? Are you ashamed of women? There are some feminists in the Muslim community who talk like this, and they attack masajid and marakis. They attack them with, this, with these kinds of claims. So it's the responsibility of the sisters to tell such feminists to shut up. Kick them out. That's your responsibility. That's Amr bin Ma'roof wa Nahi Anil Munkar. You have a duty to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. What could be a bigger evil than this, than an attack on the 
sunnah of Islam. We have this idea, again, of partnership in marriage. No, marriage is not a partnership. When Allah says in the Quran, Al-Rijalu qawamuna ala nisa in Surah An-Nisa, men are the authorities over women. That is what Allah is saying, clear cut in the Quran. And now we have people translating this ayah as, no, this means men are responsible for women. Men are, you know, the providers for women. Yeah, being qawamun means yeah, it involves responsibility, it involves being a protector, it involves being a, a provider, it involves being a caretaker. Yeah, that's all encompassed in the concept of being qawam. But there's an important component that you missed in your simp definition. Being qawamun also means to be the leader, to be the authority, to be the boss. Read any tafsir of this ayah of the Quran. They all say the same thing. They lead with that, actually. That's the primary purpose of qawam, is to be the leader. Why are we not implementing this simple order within our families, within our communities? Why? This is, this is the essence of bid'ah. This is the essence of innovation and corrupting the deen. And it's something that's only happening in our times. This is a kind of fitna that has not been experienced in at least the previous history of Islam. Maybe in the history of humankind it's been experienced. Some will claim that the society that Yusuf was a part of, alayhi salam, the prophet Yusuf, that also seemed to be a society where women had a lot of power and influence. So a tafsir of Surah Yusuf, that may be for another time. But for the history of Islam, this is the only time where this particular kind of fitna has arisen. And there are hadith that refer to this as well. Different hadith of different grades of classification and authenticity, but they all have the same message. The Prophet ﷺ warned us of a time when women would be empowered, when women would have power and they would dominate. And that's one of the signs of Akhir zaman the end of times. There are, yeah, these are hadith that have been preserved. How did the Prophet ﷺ know? How did he know? So this is proof of his prophet, another proof of prophethood. So why aren't we implementing the command of Allah within our own homes? And this is the deception, this is the satanic, or the, this is the dajjal, the deception of shaitan, that you take something that is evil and you wrap it up in good. The idea that, oh, well, we want, Everyone here, I know, even though you might be called a misogynist, I know everyone here cares about your mother, cares about your sister, cares about your daughter. You care, we care about women. We want to protect them. We want to help them. It disturbs us, the idea that they would be abused or they would be hurt. And there's nothing that would hurt a father more than his daughter crying, for example. This is how Allah has created us. We, we have a, such a soft spot for women. But this has been weaponized against us. A very, very, in a very real way. I'll give you an example. Look at the propaganda that goes out before attacking a Muslim country. What do they always say? They say, oh, look at these poor Muslim women. They're being abused by the Muslim men. Muslim men are forcing their women to cover up and they're forcing their women to wear hijab and they're forcing their women to stay in the home and they're forcing their women to be this and that. They subjugate their women. Muslims are doing that. This is terrible. These poor Afghan women, these poor Afghan girls, these poor Iraqi women, and they'll trot out you know, some of these girls to cry on camera and take pictures, oh, and print them on Time Magazine on Time Magazine, the, the photo spread of these poor Afghan women who are suffering. We have to help them. So we're just going to go and send our army 
and bomb them and bring them freedom and democracy. This is a clear propaganda. But w why does it work? Why does it work? Because men have a soft spot for women. That can be used against us and it can be used to justify the worst atrocities and the worst crimes. And it's happening to this day. It's happening to this day. Another way that this soft spot is used against men is the idea that, well, don't you want to give women their rights? Yes, of course. Islam is all about giving women their rights, we say, in this kind of inferiority complex mentality. Yeah, of course, we, oh, yeah, we give all the rights to women. This is an apologetic attitude that is destructive. And the idea of giving more and more rights to anyone eventually will lead to the disillusion and the destruction of any kind of relationship. Any kind of relationship that exists requires mutual rights and responsibilities. The way that marriage works, for example, everyone has their own role. The husband is the leader, that's his role. He has certain responsibilities and certain duties to his family members and his wife or wives and his children, they have their own duties and responsibilities and they have rights. And it's this mutual relationship of having not only do you get, but you have to give. Not only do you receive, but you have to give. That's how relationships work. But if you have this kind of mentality that no, women shouldn't be burdened with responsibilities and who are you to tell her what to do? Why does she have to have responsibilities like cooking and cleaning and child rearing? Who are you to tell her this? No, she should be free to pursue what makes her happy. What about her needs? What about self-care? And if you demand anything from your spouse, that means you're a narcissist. That means you're abusive. That means you have some kind of psychological problem. If you demand from your wife that, hey, honey, can you actually do something? Oh, what? You're a misogynist. So this is the mentality that is being spread. When you increase the rights that someone has, but not the accountability, not the responsibility, then that will destroy the relationship. That will destroy the relation. That's how you can destroy marriage. Just keep giving women infinity rights and zero accountability. That will destroy the marriage. And that's what we're seeing. And if you speak out against it and you say something, then, oh, you'll be blasted as a misogynist and they will you know, launch a campaign to prevent you from speaking at any masjid. So we have to get a backbone. We have to understand what Islam says about the rights and responsibilities of the husband, the rights and responsibilities of the wife. We recognize that any kind of company, if I said, okay, here is a Fortune 500 company, does it have a leader to make it successful? Obviously, of course. Any country, any army, does the army have a general to make, to lead his soldiers and to command his soldiers? Of course, every, any successful army has to have a general leading it. We recognize that every kind of institution, every kind of corporation, any kind of nation requires a leader, an emir. Oh, but not the family. The family, there is no leader. It's just equality, you know, a partnership. How does that make sense? And then, the, and then the sisters might say, if they haven't thought about this for more than two seconds, well, why can't the woman, why can't the wife be the leader? Why can't the wife be the boss? Okay, then go back to my first question. When I asked the sisters, do you want a husband who is going to be weaker than you, stupider than you, less accomplished than you, less driven than you? Do you want that kind of husband? Or do you want your husband to be the man, to be the leader, to be the boss? Don't ask social media this question. Ask your nature. 
Your nature will give you the right answer to this question. The same answer that every woman, woman has understood for human history. Let's actually read the example and the, the athar and the hadith, a hadith about the mothers of the believers. What were they doing? These are the best women of history, the best women of humanity. What were they busy with? Were they busy, you know, going in front and standing in front of men and speaking? They were the most knowledgeable. They were the most pious. They were the most intelligent. Were they going and, you know, leading the, the men? Was that what they were doing? Were they going in front of the Khulafa Rashidun and saying, yeah, we're women, hear us roar? A'udhu billah, no. We don't see that from the best, the best of the best of the best. So then why do we have this kind of model of, oh, empowering women? When did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say we need to empower women? Did, is there any statement like that in the seerah, in the volumes of hadith? Do we find anything like that? Because if there was, trust me, we would all have heard it a million times by now. <laughs> We don't. We don't find anything like this. Does that mean that we hate women? Does that mean that we are abusing women? No. Exactly the opposite. It's because we care about women. Because we care about the future of society. We care about marriage and family and deen. This is why we insist on following the way, the path that Allah has not only put within us, in the fitrah, in our nature, but also in his revelation and what has been revealed. So when we adopt feminism and we adopt these narratives, we're not only going against our nature, we're going against the we're going against Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is a rebellion. So that's my message. I'm not gonna prolong it. We can go into Q QA, inshallah. You can grill me, give me, you know whatever is on your minds in terms of objection. But I just want us to wake up. Please, let's wake up, let's get real. Let's stop denying the things that are right in front of us. The, the stories, the horror stories that I mentioned at the beginning. Have, do you have a friend or a family member that has experienced something similar to this? Please raise your hand. Don't be shy. It's very common. These are very common stories. So we need to wake up. Let's go into Q&A. Yeah, just text that number. destruction of liberalism yet they are too comfortable to change their lifestyle for the better example most sincere sisters agree that feminism is wrong yet they are happy being in a dominant position in their marriage or reject to obey their husband or men no no knowing it's uh, wrong to free mix and letting their wives dress uh, immodestly but are fearful to demand change because they just got used to being uh, comfortable living in a liberalistic lifestyle what advice do you give to these people? What's, com what's comfortable about it? You're comfortable being whipped? Like, I don't even understand the premise of the question. This is not comfort. This is not happiness. This is Stockholm Syndrome. You're being, you're living your worst life and you're just trying to convince yourself that this is what happiness means. No man can be happy in this situation and no woman can be happy in this situation. No matter how much she wants to listen to, I don't know what pe people are watching these days, Oprah? Or these kinds of influencers that are putting these feminist ideas into people's heads? There's no, there's no happiness here. Who, who is that prince uh, of the, in the UK who got married to 
a wife who has just completely alienated his, him from his family. They left his country. They came to the U.S. Prince Harry. Prince Harry. You think he's happy? <laughs> you think she's happy? No, I guarantee you that they're not happy. Because this goes contrary to human nature. What, what liberalism would like to do is to culturally engineer people so that they'll be happy with that kind of situation. And they propose, they have uh, proposals for how to do this. How about we introduce certain injections or certain pharmaceuticals that will reduce the testosterone levels in men and make men more docile, less aggressive, uh, less uh, domineering, uh, maybe for the sake of equality, we can introduce these pharmaceuticals uh, from a young age, and then we'll have a more gender equal society with less violence, with less aggression, with less uh, this destructive competitive mentality. This is what is on the table. These are the things that they're promoting. This is social engineering. They've been trying to social engineer us through media for how many decades now, but now we need to take it to the next step. The true revolution will take place when they actually start introducing chemicals, hormonal uh, changes in order to realize, in order to destroy the human being and replace it with this liberal model of equality and justice. Now, um, this, I think this kind of goes on for the sake of the question before. How do we approach uh, or slash convince female family members, sisters, daughters, wives, who have developed, uh, developed an affinity with ideals of feminism, where would we start? The best place to start is to with uh, just the reality. Uh, and I mentioned this yesterday in the Q&A as well. We are at a time in history where women are the most educated, women are the most empowered, women have the most uh, high-level positions within government, the most high-level positions within corporations and Fortune 500 companies. They're at the highest levels of achievement, yet they are also the most depressed, the most suicidal than th that they've ever been. The level of prescription antidepressants at, is at an all-time high. And the statistics are shocking. Somewhere around like one in four or even one in three women over the age of 20 is on antidepressants. How shocking is that? One out of three. And you think Muslims are uh, immune to this? No, the Muslims are also on these antidepressants and they're going to these counselors. And what does the counselor always say? Oh yeah, well you must have a lot of narcissists in your life. That's why you're depressed and suicidal and popping antidepressants like so put two and two together if feminism is such a road to happiness and empowerment then the most empowered in all of history but also the most depressed so you how does that make sense you explain it to me um, <laughs> considering modern times how can we find the balance if I am not uh, to let my daughter study and become uh, a doctor slash teacher, how can I expect my wife or daughter slash sister to only be treated by a female doctor? How many female doctors are needed within society? Let's just accept the premise that we have to have female doctors. How many female doctors do you think are needed to treat women in society? Out of all the women that there are within society, is it 1%? Or is it like a percent of a percent? Out of every, maybe one female doctor can treat a thousand women, for example, let's say. So do we have to push all of our daughters into that kind of work or into that kind of education, supposedly because we need female doctors? How does that make sense? And why is it only female doctors? Well, what about female maids? Do we need female maids? Do we need female daycare workers? So what, are you pushing your daughters into uh, daycare work or janitorial services because we need female maids to take care of like the female spaces? Why aren't you, inc why aren't you pushing that? 
Oh, is it because that you're re not really motivated by this idea of a need, but really you're just motivated by the West, the disbeliever saying, yeah, being a doctor is such a prestigious position and you feel insecure as a community. So you're pushing all of your daughters into something that ultimately is going to mean that they'll be less happy, less fulfilled. They won't have the same kind of joy of family life and marriage that others enjoy. Yeah, there are plenty of female doctors that they're happily married, they have kids and they're enjoying life. But for every one female doctor like that, there are many others who have, their lives have been destroyed by pursuing a medical education, by pursuing any higher education. Do we want to have a real conversation about the statistics, about the reality, or do we want to use these kinds of tired, explanations and excuses that don't make sense. Just to justify, ultimately, tashabbuh bil kufar. Just imitating the disbelievers, going down the path of the lizard hole. Let's use our heads. Let's use our heads for a second and question, be skeptical. Why are we just accepting these, this model of life and society that is being shoved down our throats and we don't have any response to it? This is not the way of the believer. The, way, the believer is a leader. The believer is a leader in his, in his practice and in his thought. We need to be leading. We need to be recognizing, okay, here's the world that we see around us is falling apart. It's being destroyed. Society is crumbling. Families are crumbling. Do we not have the sense to recognize that, okay, if we don't want to be destroyed like they're being destroyed, we have to do something different. How can we as believers not immediately have this reaction when we have the book of Allah and we have the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we have these, these examples from the best of the best of the best women. How many of them were pursuing becoming doctors and high powered executives and PhDs? How many of them? So that answers your question. Um, what are some of the, uh, oh. if a brother gets married, what are the red flags to show that the person that he's married, been married or is attempting to marry has been brainwashed by feminism? That's a good question. So red flags, uh, she has a lot of friends from the opposite sex. On her social media, she's c talking to the opposite sex. She talks about marriage as a partnership. She has a long list of demands for what she requires that have nothing to do with Islam or the Sharia. These are all major red flags. And look at her, a good indication, how does her mom treat her dad? That's a good forewarning, foreshadowing about how she's going to treat you. Uh, do men have to have leadership skills for being a leader? If a man is a leader but he's not fulfilling the rights of leadership, uh, yeah, what do you do if a man is a leader, if he's supposed to be a leader, but he's not fulfilling the rights of leadership? Yeah, so if, he's, if anyone who doesn't fulfill his duties needs to, be, needs to face consequences for that, there has to be accountability. The good news is that there is all kinds of accountability for men in the society that we live in. There are all kinds of accountability from other men, from men's families, you know, if the husband is not fulfilling his duties, guess who's going to be uh, criticizing him for that? Many people in his own family, for example. Um, his friends, for example. The imam, for example. There's, there's a lot of accountability for men. I'm not saying men are perfect. Yeah, there are men who, are, who don't fulfill their rights or their responsibilities, rather. But the problem is, the bigger problem, is that there is no accountability for women. That's what we are missing, that's what we're lacking, and that's what's causing this imbalance. When you have this imbalance where one side can 
just have no accountability, no responsibilities, then there's no relationship there. You, have, you don't even have a relationship to talk about a successful or relationship or not. There is no relationship. If the husband demands anything, if he demands anything from his spouse, that's considered abuse. That's abusive. There's no account. There's not, the man, for example, in Western societies, he can't go to court and say that, well, my wife is not you know, doing anything. She's not cooking or cleaning or raising the children. She's not you know, uh, providing in intimacy. He has no claim against her. But she can go to any court, she can go to even, she can, like I said at the beginning, she can pick up the phone and call the police, no questions asked, they'll arrest him, they'll put him in jail. So there's a lot of accountability because of a feminist legal system for men, which is fine because in Islam and the Sharia there's accountability for men, but there's also accountability for women. The system that we have in place in the West is a feminist system that creates this destructive imbalance. This is why we need Sharia. That's, this is why Islam is the only solution. To what extent, or slash, uh, what do you think of uh, women in education, uh, women being educated? Yeah, so I have an entire debate on this topic. I debated a feminist on women's education. What do we mean by education? That's the first question that we should ask. This is what it means to be a Muslim, a believer. What does an education actually mean? And when you look at the history of education, as we call it, in the West, there's generally two components to it. There's like a vo vocational component and there is a cultural component. So when you go and become educated, it's either meant to, you're getting the skills needed to become like a trade worker or a, you know, electrician or plumber or carpenter or engineer, or it's specific to those types of vocational education. And then there's a cultural education. You learn the arts, you learn literature, you learn the classics, you learn how to, you know, think the right thoughts and be a cultured person. So what does Islam say about the requirement of any of these, of this education? What is really Islamically required? The only kind of education that Islam requires is that, well, you as a man have the responsibility to provide for your family. So, okay, there's a justification for you to pursue an education in order to get a job and work to provide for your family. So that, there is an Islamic justification for pursuing that kind of education. But is there an Islamic uh, requirement for you to go learn Shakespeare and to go, you know, read Charles Dickens and A Tale of Two Cities and to, you know, understand the Mona Lisa? Is there any Islamic imperative for that? No, not for, neither for men, neither, and definitely not for women. So what does that leave women? So what, should, what are women required to pursue in terms of education? What does Islam say about that? The only thing that's required for women is to know the religious obligations, to be able to read the Quran and to, ha to know the religious obligations. That is the extent of the ob obligation of religious, uh, of knowledge. So what about everything else? What about going to college? What about going and pursuing these degrees? There's no Islamic imperative or Islamic recommendation for women to pursue that. And for men to pursue that, it's because of a need. It's, beca it's because of the responsibility and the duty that men have to provide for women. That's a privilege for women that they don't have that responsibility. That's a privilege that a woman has to be provided for by other men. One way or another. If it's not her father, then it's her husband. If it's not her husband, then it's her uncle. If it's not her uncle, then it's her brother. If it's not her brother, then it's her grandfather. If it's not her grandfather or any other male relative, then it's the imam. And so forth. There's always, a woman in Islam is never responsible for her own maintenance and upkeep. That's a privilege. 
Why aren't we understanding it as a privilege? Men have the responsibility. So then, then what is the purpose of this education? What is really, there's no benefit to it. There's no benefit to it. You're o you only value it because non-Muslims told you to, that this is necessary. Non-Muslims told you that this is beneficial. Non-Muslims said that this is what's required to be a human being. If you don't pursue this, then you're not meeting your potential. Potential for what? Potential to be a, a disbeliever like them? So the actual practical reality of what we see with women pursuing education, they go to college and when they get that degree, well, I spent four years to get this degree, might as well use it. They go into a job, they uh, advance in their careers. Maybe they want to go get a PhD, get a doctorate, get a master's. They rack up and, and it's all being funded by their dads. And oftentimes they hate their dads their patriarchal dad from back home, they're spending his money, they're getting these degrees, racking up the degrees, and then they're wondering, well, I'm not getting married. Hmm, I wonder why. I wonder why. It goes back to, well, you have a PhD. How many men, how many Muslim men have the same kind of credentials as you do at this point? And now within colleges, most of the graduates, 60% of graduates are women. Even more, a higher percentage of PhDs are women. What does that mean? That means that they have few, as you gain that education, you have fewer and fewer options for husbands. This is your own fault if you can't get married. The, the marriage crisis that we're facing definitely has to do with women's education and the pursuit of education and career and all of these things that the non-Muslims have told you to value. And you just fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. That's the source of your problem. Don't blame anyone except yourself. Don't blame the men. The Muslim men, they're trying to get married. They've been trying to get married since age 13. <laughs> Don't tell us that the men are the problem. The problem is that education that you have to get for some reason. Uh, if we see that our wives slash sisters slash mothers are aware of the deceptions of feminism and even uh, see those flaws in themselves but struggle to break those habits slash the brainwashing, how do we go about it? You can get rid of the brainwashing by raising your hands to Allah and begging for guidance. That's step number one. Step number two is to stop hating your dad. Stop hating your dad. Stop hating your grandfather. Stop hating men. That's step number two. We've been brainwashed and uh, indoctrinated into hating the previous generation of men. This is a satanic plot. This is how they cut off the ummah from our pious predecessors because it starts, like this is the path to apostasy of feminism. It starts by hating, oh, I hate the men online. I hate these ahrite wallah bros. I hate these, you know, red pill massage. I hate Andrew Tate. Ah! That's how it starts. But then, okay, well, guess who else was a man? Oh, my father. Oh, my grandfather. He, they're also these toxic patriarchal men. I hate them. Oh, but guess what? All of the great imams of history, Imam Ashafi, Imam Ahmad, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ghazali, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, these were all men. I hate them. They're Their fiqh and their knowledge is all biased by patriarchy and hatred for women. I hate them. Oh, but then guess what? Where did they get their misogyny and patriarchy from? They got it from the Salaf. Well, guess what? I hate them. Oh, and where did they get it from? Oh, well, they got it from the Sahaba. I hate them. Where did the Sahaba get it from? They got it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh, guess what? Now I'm a kafira. Now I've left Islam. Why? Because if you hadn't left it three steps before, you've left it now because now you despise the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he was a man. Why is the final Prophet a man? Where's the equality in that? Why are the MBA men? 
And guess what? In the Quran, why is Allah using the word, the pronoun huwa? He instead of she. This is misogyny. This is patriarchy. The Quran is a patriarchal book. We have to say no to the Quran. That's what the one of the biggest sheikhas, feminist says. We have to say no to the Quran because yeah, the Quran can be patriarchal too. This is the path to apostasy of feminism. So you have to get out of this hatred. Stop hating men. Stop seeing yourself as a victim. You are the most empowered that you've ever been in history. Stop blaming men. The only thing that you can blame men for is not putting in you, you in your place. That's what you should hate men for. You should hate men for not implementing the Sharia, for not implementing patriarchy. If you want to hate men for anything, hate them for that and tell them to stop being simps. That's what you need to hate men for, if anything. And then that will lead to the road to recovery, bi uh, How about, uh, this is a certain central one. How about when a man uh, decides he does not want to provide uh, for his wife and his kids? Uh, what should the woman in, in that situation uh, do? Yeah, if so, you have a deadbeat who is literally not going to provide for his wife and kids, He's a deadbeat, yes, but guess what? You have all kinds of legal options available to you. This is not like a big problem. Uh, this, the society here, the court system here will force him to pay. So you as the challenge for women is not, oh, I have no recourse. Your challenge is actually, oh, the, the legal system is going to give you more than your rights. So actually the challenge is for you to have taqwa and fear Allah and not take more than what is your Islamic right. That's the real challenge for you. But the court systems are there. There's so, so many lawyers that will help you. There's so many women's organizations that will help you. There's so many social services that will help you. So you want a condemnation of the deadbeat? Here it is. He's a deadbeat. He's not paying for his wife and kids. Islam condemns that. I'll give it to you. But you want a practical solution? There's plenty of options and uh, avenues for you to pursue. What about the man who his wife is abusing him and not meeting his needs, not fulfilling her uh, duties to him? And guess what? She's an unfit mother. What are, what are your, the options for the man? Nothing. What are the avenues or solutions for the man? Nothing. So many brothers have experienced this. Their kids have been taken from them. And literally the wife, his ex-wife is a drug addict. But the court system still finds her to be a better custodian of those children. He has no recourse. And he's a Muslim. She accuses him of being a terrorist in court. And the lawyer recommends her to do that, to assassinate his character and to use that as you know, essentially blackmail to get whatever that she wants from him. So let's ask questions about what recourse, what solutions do, them, do men have? Men are the, the vulnerable victims in this situation. How do you tell uh, your wife uh, that she can't work? And if she's working and she's making more than you do, what should you do? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can explain to her, you know, just explain, be gentle and explain these realities that it's better for her not to work. It's better for her to be at home. She'll be happier. But let's be real. It's not just all about women's happiness. Sometimes you have to do things that you might not like for the greater good. For the preservation of the marriage, for the preservation of the family, for the preservation of your children. Yeah, don't work. You might have less money in your pocket to spend on whatever you want to spend because obviously the money that she earns is her money. But if he earns, his money is his money and her money, but it never goes the other way around. So... It's better, explain, 
it's going to be better for our family if you don't work and maybe try it for some period of time. See what happens after six months, a year of not working. And then that's the first step. Just try it out. You'll be surprised. Um, another question was, there are many uh, uh, single and divorced uh, sisters in the community and they need to work and the number is quite large. Uh, is it okay for them to work? Uh, yeah, so there's, we're living in a broken world. We're living in a world that's very distant from the implementation of the perfect system, the divine system of Allah. We're very far from that. So there are realities that we have to contend with. And one of those realities is that some sisters will have to work to provide for themselves or their children. That's sometimes an inevitability. Uh, and so they're, as long as it's a halal job, uh, there's no there's no inherent problem with women working. The problem is when there is no real need to work, but you do it anyway. What reason do you have? If you don't need to, you have a husband who's going to take care of you or a father that's going to take care of you. There's no real reason for you to work. So why are you doing that? That's, that's the problem that we're talking about. Those sisters who, for whatever reason, they have no choice, there's no blame on them. They have to do certain things because of the broken world that we live in. So I just want to clarify that. Wasn't the Prophet's wife a businesswoman? <laughs> yeah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his wife Khadija radiallahu anha, was she a businesswoman? Well, the reality is she inherited land and she inherited uh, a certain kind of uh, property and goods um, that's what she inherited and in Islam women can own property women can be wealthy women can have you know that kind of wealth but did that make her a businesswoman like she's going to these meetings and uh, interacting with men and no that wasn't the case in fact that's why she had men to manage her business she had men, including the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and she didn't approach the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam herself. It was through a family mediator. So even before Islam, the rules of modesty were implemented. Again, because this is human nature. So this is a proof against the feminists. If she was this businesswoman and, you know, like a Fortune 500 CEO like we have today, she wouldn't need to have men to manage her business for her, to manage her property for her, to manage that trade for her. The fact that she did need that shows exactly the opposite of what the feminists want to prove, which is that the domain of business and the domain of public interaction is the domain of men. That's what that proves. It's the opposite of the feminist message. Oh, what are they saying? I, I don't hear them. So I should just call them out? Okay, so if there are sis I'm getting word that the sis some younger sisters are trying to over talk and trying to cause uh, fitna so maybe you can quiet down <laughs> or if you have a question you want to challenge something you can, there's the number or the number was up there you can text your challenge you know in the text say okay challenge I, I want to really vent against Daniel, and then we'll definitely read it. So, Bismillah, come on. You don't need to, you know, talk back there. Just send your question. Uh, I've got a challenge. Great. Great. <laughs> 
<laughs> sure, go ahead. Brother Daniel needs to get a reality check. <laughs> He's contradicting himself constantly. I would rather an intellectual discussion with evidence from both Quran and Hadith for both men and women's role. This feels like an attack on women unnecessarily. It doesn't feel like a balanced or realistic view. <laughs> What have I said that contradicts the Quran and Hadith and the example of Ummahat al Mu'minin? Do you know about the wives of the Prophet? The feminist narrative, this kind of Islamic feminist narrative or Muslim feminist narrative, is very selective. It's very selective and it's dishonest. Like the presentation of Khadija radiallahu anha as this kind of uh, Fortune 500 CEO, this is so distant from reality. Khadija radiallahu anha was primarily in the home, having children, taking care of children, cooking for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, cleaning for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, comforting him, being that support for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the home. That's what she was doing. That's mainly what she was involved with. The wives of the Prophet ﷺ would compete with each other to cook for the Prophet ﷺ. They're competing for cooking the best food for the Prophet ﷺ. So first, if you want to talk about hadith and the example of the Prophet ﷺ, first of all, tell me, do you accept polygamy? Do you accept polygyny? Do you accept multiple wives? Okay, if you're so concerned about what the what the hadith say and what the Quran says, first of all, tell me that you accept that, number one. Then number two, let's actually look at what are most of the Sahabiyat doing? What are their roles? What are the gender roles? And, they, and then they'll spam this hadith that the Prophet ﷺ was working in his home and he would help his family. Yeah, of course. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ would lend a helping hand and he would do certain things for himself. But was he cooking for himself? No. Was he cleaning? There are hadith, many hadith about his wives cleaning his clothes and washing his clothes. That's where many of the ahkam about tahara and purification come, comes from. How should you wash clothes in order, to, in order to purify it from certain kinds of najasa? What is najasa? All of those ahkam that we read in the mutun of fiqh are coming from these hadith which are describing the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam washing his clothes. Okay, so let's talk about those hadith. Instead of taking one hadith out of context, out of the actual lived reality of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let's look at the whole picture. And you will be very, if you're this feminist, you'll be extremely scandalized by that. You'll be extremely scandalized. And unfortunately, be careful. Be careful because many un have gone down this path of apostasy. Why? Because they adopted feminism as their deen. And then they assumed that Islam is feminism. And then when they got a little bit more educated, they realized that Islam is not feminism. So they rejected Islam. Be careful, sisters. Be careful, brothers. Be careful, your iman is at stake. Do you fear Allah? If you fear Allah, do not go down this path. It will not end well for you. Another, another challenge. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree that the problem lies mainly with men? They do not know their roles and responsibilities as fathers or brothers or husbands, etc. That's it? That's it? Uh, yeah, well, there's a lack of education. I said at the very beginning that this isn't about putting women on trial. The responsibility, if I'm claiming that men are the leaders, then if we have a problem with the adoption of feminism in our communities, then the, ultimately the buck stops at the men. Ultimately, the accountability is on men for why have we not stamped out this cancer? Yeah, I agree. Men, have to, men do have the responsibility of 
ending this terrible ideology within our communities. Yes, and the fact that it is not ended, a lot of that responsibility, most of that responsibility is on the men. I agree. This is a this is a this is a hadith, and I, I guess it's supposed to be covered. Aisha radiallahu anha was asked, "Did Rasulullah used to carry out any work in his house?" And she, may Allah be pleased with her, said, "Yes, Rasulullah used to mend his sandal, patch his garment, and work in his house, just like any of you works in his house." Yeah, like I said, this is spamming this uh, hadith and ignoring all the other hadith that give the context to this. The, I, the fact that the Prophet وسلم, would do certain things in the house does not mean that he was cooking and cleaning and doing the, you know, splitting childcare, splitting these chores with his wives. Where's the evidence for that? Where's the evidence for that? And this is something that wives need to appreciate their husbands because there's this claim about 50-50 responsibility. And I pointed this out to my wife. Uh, and maybe one day we can have uh, talk about this subject because in my own marriage, we also had this struggle. We also had this uh, struggle in understanding where exactly are the roles and rights and responsibilities of the husband versus the wife. Should we really be splitting childcare? And there was a point where I was working 40 plus hours a week and I was expected to uh, do half of the child care and half of the, you know, changing diapers and half of these other domestic responsibilities. Not fully half, obviously, but, you know, more than uh, she, I was taking a share of that kind of work. And, but men who take that level of not only are they working full time, but they're also expected to take care of child care, cooking and cleaning, etc., other domestic responsibilities. There is not enough appreciation for what a man actually does and is supposed to do as a leader within his family. So my wife one day said, well, you know, the baby needs to have his diaper changed. Can you go change the diaper? I'm like, no, I don't feel like changing the diaper. And then so this became the source of you know, she was surprised, you know, well, why not? I'm tired, I've been dealing with the kids all day, and this one diaper, you can't change it? Why not? I said, look, what happens if there's a problem with the refrigerator? Who's going to figure out how to fix the refrigerator? What if there's a problem with the car? Who's going to fix the car or find a mechanic to fix the car? What happens if there's a problem with the air conditioning? What if there's a problem with the taxes? What if there's a problem with the uh, neighborhood zoning, neighborhood requirements? Who's going to take care of that? I have to change all those diapers. I'm responsible for those, is it not? And those things are much more stressful, much more taxing, much they're not as common, it's not every day, but when they happen, these are emergencies, these are fires that I have to put out as the man, and I have no problem with that. What men have to do is appreciate their own role and what they are offering, because society, because of this social engineering, is constantly belittling men, constantly belittling men and saying men are really lazy bums, deadbeats, they don't pull their own weight, they're just sitting back and expecting women to take care of it all. This is garbage, this is nonsense. This is disrespect to our fathers and our grandfathers and what they have done to, us, to build civilization, to build the families that we have inherited. So we have to uphold that and be proud of our roles as qawwamun. If there's no appreciation of that, that's how you get this dissatisfaction. That's why she's dissatisfied in her marriage. That's why she doesn't respect her husband. That's why she has these kinds of demands and she's just going to cite this hadith out of context. This is a problem. Not enough appreciation for what a man can contributes. Okay? Next time you feel as a wife that your husband is not contributing enough 
And by the way, the Prophet ﷺ has warned about this trait of women and how it is leading to hellfire. يَكْفُرْنَ الْعَشِيرِ يَكْفُرْنَ الْإِحْسَانِ the, whim, the woman denies the good, the ihsan, the benefits that she gets, she denies them by her nature. And she just sees one wrong thing with you and she will say, oh, I've never seen anything good from you. This is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is, a, this is a wake up call. This is very scary for women. Are you ungrateful for what your husband is contributing? Next time you feel ungrateful, remember that when you're sleeping at night, if you hear a glass break, the window of your house break, or someone knocking on the door, slamming the door, it's not you that's going to go and deal with whatever is busting into your house in the middle of the night. It's not you that's going to do that. It's your husband. So maybe you should appreciate him. Or if that's too dramatic for you, next time there's a spider in the bathroom, Maybe you should appreciate your husband a little bit. Challenge. You mentioned something about uh, women gaining weight and how physical attraction is important. I get it. But women also have a physical desire. Every second man nowadays has a shabby beard and hair and a huge pot belly, many to fix up if they want to submissive one. Yeah, sure, no problem. Men need to, you know, get in shape, work out, watch what we eat, no problem, that's, that's true. But if you have that kind of demand, okay, then you live up to it as well. You live it, we both have to encourage, each side has to encourage each other to get better. I mean, you, you can vent your frustration and make these kinds of silly comments, but focus on the real message that I'm trying to convey to you here. We have jujitsu, by the way, so. <laughs> nice plug. <laughs> Good plug, yeah. Um, it's another chance. Why are you... <laughs> While you talk so much about the atrocities being put on men, haven't you heard about all the abuse that men do to women? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone, yeah, we've, we've heard about it, trust me. <laughs> we've, heard, we've, we've heard about this uh, terrible genocide against women, supposedly. I mean, this is complete nonsense. Uh, the abuse that happens against women you can look at the statistics. There are statistics about domestic violence and what's called IPV, intimate partner violence. And when it comes to physical violence, you'd be surprised that the numbers are pretty even. I was surprised by this because you'd expect men to be more aggressive. But in reality, the incidents that involve uh, women violently abusing their male partners is around the same levels as men abusing female partners with physical violence. That in itself is surprising. But even if we put that aside, as, oh, that's probably, and this is based on hundreds of studies that have been compiled, and this is called parity. The researchers call this parity in IPV, in intimate partner violence, that when you bring all of the studies and do a meta study about, okay, who's, which gender is really responsible for the violence, uh, surprisingly, it seems to be split. Women are just as violent, apparently. Uh, but let's put that aside and let's say, yeah, men are the more physically violent in uh, relationships. But guess what? Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words are going to break your heart, break your soul. And who is actually m more capable of emotional manipulation who which gender is more capable of ruining your life emotionally psychologically it's the women women are more adept they're more skilled in that kind of abuse women can be more manipulative they have that kind of emotional intelligence at a higher level than what men do 
So what men have in strength, they lack in the emotional strength that women have, the emotional uh, skill that women have. When it comes to that kind of emotional abuse, women are much more the aggressor. Women are much more at fault. Why aren't we talking about that kind of abuse? Yeah, and the justice system, quote-unquote justice system, also favors women in this day and age. So, um, just with the challenges, yeah, could we just, you know, keep it uh, short, please, so I can get to the actual question? Yeah, I'm not going to ask that. And the other thing is that the stories of women getting abused are shared uh, much more frequently because that's the nature of women to share their emotions and their feelings and even the smallest thing, they will share that because that's how women communicate. But men do not communicate in the same way. A man might go through the worst kind of challenges and problems and abuse and he won't communicate that. He won't share that. It becomes a source of shame or embarrassment to talk about, oh, this is how my wife is treating me or this is the kind of abuse that I face. They won't share that in the, to the same extent. So what does, that ha what does that result in? You have a proliferation of all of these stories and anecdotes about women getting abused, but no one is really hearing about the problems that men face and the difficulties that they have within their relationships. Just because you haven't heard what's happening, that doesn't mean that it's not happening. Uh, they say it's a challenge, I don't see it. I agree with everything you stipulate, but I don't see a recourse of action that can be taken when the man does not fulfill his duties. What keeps him accountable and how patient should I be with a spouse who isn't fulfilling his duties? What duties is he not is he not fulfilling? Let's be more specific. Because sometimes this expression is used, he's not fulfilling his duties, and then you ask, okay, well, what is, what's the duty that's not being fulfilled? And it's just a vague answer that, you know, has no substance to it. Be specific. Like, what duty is he not fulfilling? Oh, he's, he's not fulfilling his duties because we only go on one vacation a year instead of two. What do you mean duties? Do you even know what the duties of the husband are that he's not fulfilling? Oh, he's not fulfilling his duties because I don't have the same, you know, kind of car or clothes, fashion designer clothes that my friends have. So he's not fulfilling his duties. What are the duties that he's not fulfilling? Be specific. Do you know what Islam says his duties are? If you don't know, then you need to educate yourself. You need to learn. Otherwise, you might be demanding something that is not actually your right. And if you do that, that's considered dhulm. That's considered oppression. Don't think that just because you are physically smaller than him and physically weaker than him, that you cannot oppress him, that you can't be a dhulima, an oppressor against him. Yes, you can be. Yes, you can be. How do I convince my first wife that I want to marry another one? <laughs> so the thing about um, multiple wives, you don't have to personally like it. And the majority of women, by their nature, they won't really like it. Well, actually, you know, they won't really like it in one sense, but in another sense, they do like it. It's a weird contradiction. Why? Because if your husband is able to attract multiple women and convince them to, to marry him, then he's a man's man. <laughs> 
or in the in the words of you know internet culture he's a chad so that actually is attractive to women and they say that men who are married attract more women than men who are single isn't this a strange phenomenon men who are married are actually seen as more attractive to women than men who are signal, single. So this is, a, this is a weird contradiction within the female psychology. But obviously they also do not want to share their husbands, obviously. So my recommendation is that for men, make sure that this is what you want to do, to pursue a second wife or multiple wives the world that we live in, first of all, I don't even know if it's legal in Australia. So if it's illegal, I'm not recommending you do anything illegal. But we're just talking hypothetically or theoretically. Um, it's very difficult to maintain even one family, let alone two. So just because you Islamically have the right to do something, that does not mean you should do it or you should pursue it. What Islam says in terms of the hukum, like is something permissible, is it makruh, like disliked, or is it haram, that is going to be up to your individual circumstance. So let's say that you have the financial ability and the means to support multiple families, and you have a desire that you want, you know, you need multiple wives for that, okay, then it might be recommended for you to get a second wife. How are you going to convince the first wife? May Allah help you. <laughs> and I don't have experience, so I can't give you advice based on experience, but I recommend being very careful about it. And, but we need to talk about it. We need to normalize the idea of it, even within Muslim societies where even prior to the influence of the West, prior to colonialism, what percentage of men actually had multiple wives? Was it 10%? Was it 5%? Was it 20%? I doubt it was 20%. It's much less. Even within polygamous societies, on average, only 5% of men in polygynous societies will have multiple wives. It's something for men who have a lot of resources and have that high social status that they can get multiple women to commit to a marriage to them. So this is why the Prophet ﷺ had so many wives. He was the best of the best of the best. Not only in terms of deen, but also in terms of dunya. He was handsome from the best lineage, the best manners. All, he had everything going for him in terms of dunya. Even if we put him being the best of creation aside in terms of being the seal of the prophets. So even in polygynous society, it's something that's rare. So, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I can't give you practical advice on how to convince your wife. <laughs> if I had the answer to that, you know, I would use it myself maybe. <laughs> I hope my wife doesn't see this, but. <laughs> First one is, um, what is your opinion on uh, marital rape? Yeah, there's no such thing. The thing about, so uh, consent is something that is important in Islam. Uh, when you get married, you give consent. And the consent means that you are um, consenting to that the role of being a wife and having the responsibility of providing intimacy when your spouse asks for it or wants it. Now, a good husband is going to be considerate and he's not going to force himself and, you know, get angry. Sometimes there are legitimate excuses or legitimate reasons not to want to engage in intimacy. And a husband should respect that. And that's just, that's just basic knowledge, basic character that I don't think I need to teach anyone this. 
But the feminists have taken this to the extent where they say that he has no right to intimacy. He has no right to be intimate with me. And this is just false. This is, this is a negation of your duty as a wife. When you consented to get married and your wale, your father, consented for you to get married, that is part of it. What about, you know, if we take this logic of quote-unquote marital rape to its logical conclusion, then you can say, well, what about marital harassment? You know, if your husband kisses you without your consent, oh, this is marital harassment. Okay? Or he, he looked at me. This is, or he made some kind of, you know, remark and he called me honey, he called me sweetie, he sexualized me. Without my consent, this is marital harassment. This is marital catcalling. I'm going to take him to court. That, by that logic, you didn't consent in that moment for him to call you sweetie or call you honey. Maybe you didn't appreciate it. Maybe that's abuse. Or why don't we talk about marital trespassing? We can turn the tables. Did your husband give you consent to you sleeping in the bed tonight? At his house, he bought the house. He's paying the rent and you're sleeping in, in the bedroom or you're sitting on the couch, did you get your husband's permission to sit in the couch? Did you get his permission to open the refrigerator and take out a drink? Did you get his permission? Okay, you're, this is marital stealing. This is marital trespassing. He can take you to court. He can call the police. Oh, my wife is stealing from me. I didn't give her permission to sit on my couch tonight. What, would, what do the sisters say to that? Say, oh, well, he agreed to marry me, so then I... Okay, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Why does it only go one way? Use your heads. Use your heads. Stop just parroting and aping the kofar. This is, this is, it's brain rot. Feminism is brain rot. It makes you an in, into an idiot. <laughs> Think. I have a question. How do we tackle a situation where our wife's friend is working and she tells stories of how she saves for traveling and uh, the husband is running the family expenses, whereas we're the only breadwinner and we can't match that lifestyle. How do we overcome that obstacle? Yeah, you have to be extremely careful about who your wife's friends are. That's the number one source of divorce, actually. So if you don't Look at who your friends, your wife, wife's friends are. If they're a bunch of divorcees, they're a bunch of man haters. Guess what your wife is going to be very soon. So protect yourself. Don't be uh, oblivious to the reality. Women influence each other. Make sure that the friends of your wife are in happy marriages. They are religious they have taqwa, they fear Allah, they are actually practicing Islam as it's meant to be practiced, they're following the Quran and Sunnah and its details, they're not feminists. You have the responsibility, you can't blame anyone other than yourself if you just let her associate with shayateen. That's on you. No more? Okay, alhamdulillah, I'm glad that we addressed all of the questions and there's no more. Feminism has been defeated, alhamdulillah, there's no more. Alhamdulillah. Takbir. 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 This quick announcement before we do. Tomorrow night we will continue at 8 p.m. as usual. Tomorrow's topic is First Worldism, Modernity and the Reality of Jihad. That's 8 o'clock tomorrow night, 8 p.m. at HOIC. Also, Noble Park. Uh, Daniel Hafnagel will be at Noble Park tomorrow at 3.30. 3.30, Noble Park at 79 Overseas Drive, Noble Park. It's all uh, available on our Facebook. Interperformance Gym is the place. And the topic is lessons from the that? story of Ruf alayhi salam. Jazakumullah khair wa salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi 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 wa r
Please.